Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to do a sword log vlog vlog type thing where I, where I attempt to answer a question that I've been asked a lot of times in a lot of different ways, and that is, why do I break swords? What's the point? And maybe I can answer a few other things along the way, like what got me started in doing it, and would I would I advocate anyone else do it? Is there any any benefit? And I can I can also give my side of the argument of is is it worth it? Is is it does it <laughs> does it give uh, more benefit than harm, if you will? Because a lot of people don't like the idea of breaking swords at all. Um, so hopefully this this video will give give you my my thoughts on the subject, answer the question, and hopefully spur some fun conversation along the way. Uh, you can see I've broken a few of them. If you haven't seen videos, each one of these, uh, with the exception, I think, of this one here, uh, is a sword that I broke in some various review at some point. And there's there's certainly more of them than this little uh, little goofy trophy looking thing over here. But uh, I, I have broken a number of swords, and I would say the the reason I do it is is more or less the same across the board, and that is. Uh, it's fun, and I, I'm blessed with the opportunity to do it. A long time ago, from a historic perspective, I reached out to Ronick and kind of asked for a couple review samples to be sent for me to break. I guess the the whole how that happened is a different story, but suffice to say, they sent me a couple swords, and I had the opportunity to to break a couple swords. And that relationship continued. Ronan and Katana, I guess, seemed to like what what I did or find found it to be of some value, and so I I got a couple more swords from them. And then it started happening with other manufacturers outside of Ronan and Katana. And now I've I've broken a number of different swords and continue to, and I have I have frankly a blast doing it. I would say, though, that when I started, I did not expect there to be a, a martial learning context to happen. I wasn't doing it to be better at swordsmanship. Um, I, I, that's something I think I could be doing better now for, for a different reason, which I'll touch on in a moment. But I would say it was just, it looked like a lot of fun. Obviously, I'd, I'd had some experience with swords prior to that, but I'd never pushed a sword outside of maybe a piece of garbage you know, or, or some relatively inexpensive thing uh, that was already diminished in condition. I hadn't, I hadn't pushed it, done any other kind of testing that I've, I've done now, or maybe abusive usage is a better word, given that testing implies some sort of science, and that's not, not what I'm doing. Uh, that said, it's, it's purely just for fun. It's because I have the opportunity. I'll either reach out to a company or they'll reach out to me. I ask if I can break a sword, or they'll ask me if I'm willing to review one, and I say yes, because why why wouldn't I? It's a, it's a sword, and I get to swing it around, and I get to experience it, I get to get to feel how it is, get to gauge what I like about it. My horizons are expanded from, from the experience, just in terms of uh, the, the holding of many different swords and figuring out what types of balance I like and, and moving them around and maybe buying. I get a chance to see things that I wouldn't otherwise get to see and have experiences I wouldn't otherwise get to have and meet people that I wouldn't otherwise get to meet. So all in all, it's, it's a pretty net positive um, even though it can be it can be a little thankless job making YouTube videos. There's also learning that happens outside of the, the sword thing or the experience there. I did expect to have to learn how to record video and how to edit it and how to put it on YouTube and all of those are learning experiences and something I still continue to learn at. But the, the point is when I got into it, it was just it, mostly because it seemed like a really fun thing to do. And uh, I did not expect to be better as a martial artist as a result of doing it, but I would argue that there is some merit in, in doing that, and hopefully here's here's kind of the reason there. So uh, if I step back a few paces and look at the two Japanese styles of swordsmanship that I study, I study two different martial arts. One of them I can show you, the other I am, I'm forbidden from, from uh, showing any kind of video of me practicing or teaching it. Uh, I can I can talk about, about it a little bit, but I have to kind of mind my P's and Q's because they're sensitive about that kind of thing, and that's what I signed up for. Anyway, there's two different styles of martial arts that I study. In one, we do Iaido. Well, in both, we do Iaido. But in one, I'm, I'm cutting uh, regularly, or we're using sharp swords, or people in the dojo are using sharp swords, and they're cutting stationary tatami mats. They do it competitively. They do it very well. There are, there are aspects of cutting tatami that you're you're trying to achieve, and it's a whole sport. It's a whole competitive thing that you can do, uh, that you can get better at, that you can be nitpicked on. There's there's a, a, a lot of different aspects to, to what you're trying to achieve in that, that aspect of swordsmanship. Um, by contrast, that group doesn't uh, spar a ton, I suppose I would say, and not because it's not in the martial art, but just because the, the group doesn't doesn't always do it. Uh, also, there's there's not the same kind of paired exchanges that are in the other. In, in the other, there's a lot of kind of paired kata that you're you're working on, um, but it's largely done with wooden sticks. Obviously, you break out an iaito or a sharp sword if the the place you're you're in allows you to do that. Sometimes some dojos are uncomfortable with using sharp swords because obviously insurance reasons and other things, but. Suffice to say, the majority of the martial art, as I've experienced it, has been in the exchange of Boken kind of paired kata. And you get certainly a different aspect repeating that kata over and over and over again 
uh, you start to hopefully see, as, as I'm starting to, uh, the purpose behind it and, and garner some some uh, some lessons from it, some, some depth to it. Anyway, the, the point is that in no in none of those exchanges am I doing live sword on sword contact, right? I, I don't, if I'm doing a stick, sticks obviously can resemble uh, the weight of swords in some cases, but the, they don't they don't act the same way when you bind them together or, or whack them together. They, they react differently. And so I can obviously take liberties with my partner and do things with a stick because I'm not as worried about hurting them. Um, I can swing a sword at a target in the other martial art and try to learn how to, how to cut and, and have edge alignment. And both of them provide me very valuable aspects on, on martial arts. And uh, I, one doesn't kind of give me the, the complete picture. Uh, I, I garner a lot from, from studying two different martial arts. But in neither one of them, uh, do I clash live blades together? And even as I look at historic European martial arts, and now, bear in mind, I'm talking out of my ass a little bit, I don't study historic European martial arts, but I've seen videos, I've seen people do it at the, the sword club where I uh, I do one of the martial arts. They also have fencing and historic European martial arts, and every now and again I'll get to see see some action happening there. And the, the fetters used don't seem to have um, an edge that, that really reacts the same way a live edge would. It, it, they react because they're dulled a little differently. I've gotten to see them. I don't own any because I don't, I don't study HEMA. Um, but I, they, they, they just react differently. And obviously, I'm not saying that they're bad. They give you an opportunity to practice swordsmanship in a way that, again, provides that kind of paired uh, duo. The same way I'm, I'm working with sticks, but perhaps to a, a greater degree in some regards and less in others. And that, again, just a different argument. The point is that a fetter or a, a dulled stage combat blade or something where you're clashing steel together doesn't act the same way that a sharp sword does. It, it, they, don't, they don't react together the same way. And that's where I suppose I've started to gain some knowledge in learning. And I had to take that long journey to get here to kind of explain that when you clash two sharp edges together or two live swords, which is what inevitably I'll do in some of these videos, um, there's, a, there's a reaction that happens that I don't, I wouldn't otherwise get to perceive um, or, or really understand if it, if it weren't for that experience. Now, unfortunately, at this point, I have not gotten a product from a company and taken the time to work up some sort of safe rig where I could practice a uh, live blade to live blade with something even remotely analogous to another person. Obviously when you're using live blades it's it's tough to find a training partner. I certainly wouldn't want to put my, my wife or daughter in that position. Um, it's not something anyone at my, my in the various clubs that I'm, I'm in related to swords would want to do or something that I'd be even comfortable asking. So I'd want to find some sort of rig or apparatus and it's not because any company has said I can't, but I do feel obligated in the exchange of a company giving me a sword to break to then produce a video in a in a timely manner. I suppose that's the only obligation I really deep down really feel is that I'm being given this thing so that I can share that with with other people and and uh, that's the obligation that I have. So I never feel like I really want to take the time to build some sort of apparatus to benefit myself as a practitioner rather than uh, purely evaluate the object to the best of my ability. So but that's something I'm, I'm sure I should, well, not I'm sure, I should look at doing that in the future. I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's something that's kind of been weighing on my mind a little bit and something I'd like to learn more about. It's certainly something I feel I would benefit from, so I should, I should probably get off my keister and do it. Uh, the point is, though, that that binding between swords reacts just differently. Even if you're using sharp edge to a flat or sharp edge to the, the spine of a katana, or if I have European swords and I'm, I'm using edge on edge or edge on flat, they can react. The the sharpened edge bites in sometimes to some of the softer steel, and there's just opportunities to control and manipulate your opponent's blade that are, are there. I'm not going to say that they're terribly useful. It's just an aspect of, of swordsmanship that, that happens when you're working with live swords. And if you're interested in the subject, then there's this, this little uh, grain of experience, this little kind of interaction between you and your opponent or you and another blade um, that, that may be of interest. And so when I say, is it is it helpful for somebody else? And one, I wouldn't say that it's uh, super informative to do. It, it takes a little, it takes a couple times to do, but it, it seems like there are live functional blades. One of them was in here that was $50. And it's not the greatest analogy to a Japanese katana, but it's it's a functional blade and it's 1045, which is reasonably analogous to some historic swords in, in rough theory. And so while you're not necessarily, you know, I would say there's a lot of holes here scientifically, the point is, if you wanted to experience how two live blades bind together in the realm of katana, you could do that for around $100, give or take. And I don't think that that's going to 
it would chew up an afternoon the same way spending a hundred dollars at the gun range or golf course or any other expensive hobby you might have would and it gives you some level of knowledge and experience that if you're if you're making some logical attempt at, at trying to trying to do in a safe and uh, and helpful way I think might give you some level of experience that you don't otherwise get in in the martial arts classes so that's that's where I'd say it would be beneficial the other bit is that it's it's fun um, I don't know why I said that weird. It's fun cutting shaving cream cans and laptops and stuff like that. And looking at the footage is is kind of it's it's fun and it continues to drive passion in the subject uh, that I that I have already a lot of passion for. So it, it continues and renews my interest in some of these things. And I don't necessarily think that that's that's bad either to to continue to motivate yourself and stay positive about things, even if that positivity comes from cutting shaving cream cans. So. Uh, the point is that it, it can be a lot of fun as well, and I don't think that that's that's a bad enough motivation in and of itself. If it's if it's something apart, apart from the the learning side that you might also garner for it from it. Um, beyond that, it is interesting as well if you're using a product and you know that the the interaction is not going to go well between the sword and whatever object you're hitting. You're doing it defensively or to push the sword to its limits to kind of have a feel for how far you can push swords and how they react to things. I, I don't necessarily get that in the exchanges I have. In, in the martial arts groups I'm involved in, bow can react differently, uh, and if I'm if I'm kind of trying to deflect or divert my opponent's blade or weapon out of the way, uh, wood reacts differently to metal, to logs, to other things, and and so it, it can be helpful from from a martial aspect there as well. The more targets you you work on or play with, so that that's kind of the why I think you might want to do it, why I started what I find fun about it. But I want to move on to one other thing, and that is the general argument of are destructive tests bad, right? Because I've, I've heard some pretty reasoned arguments around are, are destructive tests bad, and hopefully, obviously because I do them, I'm a little biased in this thing because my opinion is written on my channel, if you will. I do the destructive tests, and I like to think if I found them harmful that I would I would not be doing them. Hopefully they're helpful. The The reason being is that you, the consumer of those videos would uh, would get a chance to see what the sword is capable of, not necessarily to not destroy it yourself, but to, to have an idea how that product would last and if it can withstand chopping logs and being beaten into steel drums and sword-on-sword -sword contact and survive several hits in, in those regards that are clearly abusive, it hopefully gives you some idea that the product is made in such a way that it will last for your intended uses and, and whatever they might, might happen to be. I don't know what they are. A lot of people are just like to have fun in the backyard. Some people are, are buying it as a zombie apocalypse kind of home invasion type thing. Uh, some people are buying it as students. Some people are buying it just because they like the look of it and they're collectors. And I, I don't know. And every every shade of color in between there as well. So I don't know why people buy it, but the video I produce hopefully gives you an idea of what the product is capable of and if it is if it is worth your investment or not. Uh, so I, hopefully I'm, I'm adding more than I'm subtracting or helping more than I'm, I'm hurting. But I can certainly understand that it might give people the wrong idea of what you do with swords or that it might uh, it might inspire people to do things that are dangerous, which I certainly hope is not the case. Obviously, I think moving around a big razor blade is, is very dangerous and should be done with, with the utmost in caution, even if I don't represent that myself. Um, I know safety glasses are something I should invest in. I, I'm, I'm getting that comment enough. I... I should. I actually own safety glasses, and for some reason, just didn't put them on. But the the point is that um, hopefully it's helpful. And obviously, I understand that some people just don't like seeing a perfectly functional sword destroyed when somebody else in the world might be enjoying it. But I would argue that if if the mere if if the if the idea is that somebody else might enjoy that sword, uh, very often the videos that I make will get a thousand ish uh, views, which I know isn't as, as much as some, but if, if a thousand people uh, watch that video and learn or gain something from it, then, then that seems uh, pretty representative to one person uh, having, having some fun with a sword. It seems like I'm, I'm, I'm potentially interacting with more people and helping them make a decision on if they should or shouldn't buy something than, than one person enjoying, enjoying one object at a time. Anyway, uh, if you have some argument as to why destructive tests may be bad or harmful or not a good thing to do, I'm, I'm interested in the conversation. I've heard some arguments before, and I, I don't know that I could really represent them myself fairly. So if you have one, throw it in the commentary down below. It, not to harp on you, obviously, I've, I clearly have my own opinion on it, but I'm interested certainly in the conversation and what yours might be. So if you, if you have an argument as to why they're bad, then throw it out there. I'm interested in it. Likewise, if if they're good for a different reason that I haven't mentioned, also worthy. I'm just kind of curious on people's thoughts on if destructive tests are, are helpful or hurtful um, and, and kind of 
anything in between. Anyway, uh, those are some general thoughts on swords, why I break them. Hopefully it's been an interesting video. Ramble, ramble, ramble. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.